So we're talking about focal lengths. What that means is the actual distance from you to your subject. Okay, so on the left is just taken with a standard lens. And on the pinnacle of that rock in the foreground is a small wee bird. So if we look to the right, we can see that's about thousand millimeter. So in photographic terms, that's using a thousand millimeter lens to get that size of image. Next presentation, next page, please. So if we actually then, so the first one picture with the bird on was at 25. We're now looking at pushing the zoom eyepiece all the way to 60 times. So what you'll notice with that picture is with the, the Kawa scopes, especially at the top end scopes, we have uh, fluorite in the objective lens and this reduces chromatic aberration and on anything white this really does stand out and shows why we have the fluorite in to reduce the chromatic aberration or colour fringing as it's called but that picture is on 60 times which is equivalent to over nearly two and a half thousand millimetre lens if one existed I'm sure the military have something like this next next screen please so we've got two ways really to measure, to mount up um, micro four thirds or even a DSLR like a Canon or a Nikon. Uh, but obviously the micro four thirds cameras like the Sony's, the Olympus, the Fuji films, and obviously the Panasonic's. So we go back to the diagram on the bottom and we can see purely the, the bottom ring. We can see the sleeve where we take out the eyepiece we take off the plastic circle protective and there's another thread on the actual body. Again, people don't realize this, that our, uh, our chief engineer, aguchi san in Japan, when he created this a good number of years ago, and you have to remember that the 883, 884, they're a good 14 year old design and they still hold their own in the top three um, botting scopes sold in the world. They really, really are. Going back to the picture. <laughs> So we have an inner sleeve ring, sorry, an outer sleeve. Yes, it's an inner sleeve ring. We then put the eyepiece back in. If we jump to the ring between the, cower, the camera body and the adapter, that's how we connect the body um, with the adapter, which you can see with a hole in. And we actually have a piece of glass in there to stop any of the dirt going to the sensor. So once that's all joined up, we can then with our PA7 or PA7A, you can see on the above picture how that goes. You can literally see how that works. Next screen. So with the PA7A, we can see that this is actually a bit more magnification. Um, and um, you can again see the, the, the example of the, of, the, of the gull on the rock, the herring gull on the rock and obviously on 60 on 25 times on the picture so again if we go now to the next screen that's on 60 times i think i can see that with my writing yeah and again it just shows you the power the magnification what you can have so two methods of taking it one with just the body the t2 ring and the adapter and the sleeve and the other with the body pancake lens and, and the adapter ring adapter and a sleeve so two ways to actually take with pictures with the, uh, the with the setup again try to demystify this because some people think it's quite complicated so therefore we can you know we can work on with that okay next screen please so one thing that comes up with using micro four thirds is what is 4k what is 6k well, this refers to the video and the video can be run at 4K or on some of the models and some of the newer models, 6K. So the beauty of what this is about really is, next screen, please. So, and, and how, we do, how do we use it in digiscoping? So people say to me, well, what's it called? Well, in the old days of the digiscoping, if anybody's gone that far back we used to call it a screen grab from a video but in this day and age now with the 4k 
4K is probably where we literally shoot video. We can control all the actions on the video settings as we can with a camera, which is the ISO speed, the shutter speed, the white balance, we can various things that we can control. And so the idea is we can use a short clip of some kind of action and can we literally, depending if we're using 24 frames a second or 30 frames a second, that means we can actually take one of those frames and use it. So as I said, so it would be a throwaway kind of situation before, but with 4K now, that's about eight megapixels. Um, 6K, obviously more, and obviously for the future, 8K. So the quality of the cameras and the sensors are getting better with the electronic um, guts that's inside the camera, but also the ability where previously we can actually try and get something in action. Again, if we're fast enough with the ISO and the shutter speed. Next, please. Next screen. So we got various ways to do this, the formats, the recording qualities, and obviously you can control this through the, through the, through the menus. Um, some various people, yes, you can change the settings. It's, as I said to you before, you've got various bits and pieces, but it allows you to, to take an image, I'm not going on to video thing yet, it allows you to take an image and basically grab 24 frames a second, 25 frames a second, 30 frames a second, which means you can take a picture of that. So the possibilities start to actually turn into a reality where you can actually take that off. So next screen, please. Really, really easy. A very, you just play back, play the, play back the setting, and you can literally go frame by frame by frame and literally using the menu system on the side of the camera, just literally save it and it saves it to the memory stick or the memory card right next to it. That's how easy it is. It's not complicated, but it is a JPEG, not a RAW. Next one, please. So, as I say, we printed various things up to um, A2, A3 from a 4k 6k stills and they hold their own all again it's about the sharpness so next screen please so just a couple of hints and tips here um you can use a panasonic or a sony or a fuji or olympus uh, lens with a focal length depending on the focal length what's offered I tend to use the Panasonic one. Um, can we go back to my screen, please? Just to show you. Back to my screen. Thank you, Jeff. So basically, um, that's what I call a pancake lens. So that is, that really does join to the to the to the lens. So in the real in the real world, this is what it actually looks like. So we have the body the lens, the ring attaching the adapter, and it literally comes off like that. Okay, back to the screen, please, Jeff. If we could. So a couple of hints and tips, really. My screen coming back on, and here we go. So, so, can you hit that, Jeff, please? Thank you. Play. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so you, the world's fastest, well, focus, the G9. That's my current camera of choice. I've had this now for three years. Primarily Panasonic have been pushing the video side of their cameras. This is probably the probably the highest resolution camera that they produce, which their primary aim was for stills. Um, you can see there it was 6K photo really fast autofocus got high resolution mode and the built-in image style stabilization some people say to me do you think it works i think in some cases it does in some cases it doesn't you can you can experiment the hell out of this but for me i do actually use it i, I use it on because i use also being a panasonic ambassador i use this stuff with uh, what we call normal lenses next screen please So, again, these things that work out of smoother video where you can actually get 60, 60 frames per second. Um, it's got a 
a reasonable amount of a uh, pixel count. Um, the 6K and 4K burst, so you can put it into this 6K 4 bay burst and can use it as a video or you can use it as pictures. So as I said to you before, the ability to shoot 24 or 30 frames a second and then actually pull that out from it. Next screen, please. So here's a few pictures um, I took. This was with the coward telephoto lens. This is what we call in the UK a male sparrow hawk. Um, that lovely orange eye, beautiful bird. Next one, please. Okay, people say, oh, I don't take pictures in the rain. It's something I don't do. I don't want to get my equipment wet. Well, if you're a birder and you've got a scope, that's waterproof. Most of them will be waterproof. And likewise with the camera, they are making them, you know, resistant. So again, it creates an atmosphere. And when people walk off, you'll still find me there sat taking pictures in the rain. Next screen, please. And that's called a dotterel and it's a female. Okay, now then, this was, this bird is a red-billed tropic bird. And I took this picture on the island of Sal off the Cape Verde Islands off West Africa. I was lucky enough to just walk into a shop offering various activities and the guy in the shop was English and he had um, been to university with Chris Packham <coughs> and his love of birds but he also did like quad biking, uh, lemon shark, wading out in these small pools there and various things. And I, just, I just said I want to see a tropic bird so we went off to see it the next morning. He got some guys who were doing research and I had the most marvellous experience of sitting on a rocky outcrop and I had maybe a dozen birds in the air plus the birds nesting in the cliffs around. And what anybody who's watching this has to realise is the, the way that to take a picture with a scope, we'll come back to this in a minute, is manual focus. So in other words, you've got your eye to the viewfinder and you've got your hand on the focus wheel and you have to try and get this picture. So for me, especially to get something like this, because you do not have a really big depth of field, DOF as they call it in photographic terms. So this red-billed tropic bird, probably one of, my, one of my top 10 birds to see and I wasn't disappointed. Next picture, please. So up on the moors, either in Scotland or even in England, we have moorland and moorland birds. And this is a red grouse and this is a male. They can just sit there and be so camouflaged, but these tiny roads that lead up there, there's quite a few birds about, so it's easy just to sit and wait. And if you look very carefully, you'll actually see, again, the specks of rain on the, on the mantle of the bird and actually on the head. I just love getting pictures in the rain. It just adds another dimension to it. Next picture. If you, anybody knows me here at all, and can you do me a favor? I think Jeff will just ask a few people if they can on the Zoom or even on the Facebook. Can you just put where you're from? Just put it in on a, on a, on a quick type in please people. We're just very, I'm very interested and curious to see how far this Zoom thing works and how far it reaches. So um, I'm lucky enough to live in Hertfordshire in the UK and we have maybe one or two places which are quite unique in that in the winter, we get on a man-made river in one of the parks we get maybe two or three kingfishers overwintering and this is one of those birds um, from maybe two years ago and they are normally with a kingfisher you don't get anywhere near 50 yards to these birds but if I tell you if I could just stand back from this picture that I took and you would have seen maybe four or five photographers I was quite close here maybe 10 or 15 uh, the picture is not cropped. I shot it in 169. And there is kids, kids with bicycles, mums and dads, prams, and everybody's walking down. And this, this female is just sat there waiting like a young female. Um, there was another one this Christmas as well, this winter, which I got in January before, obviously, the lockdown that we had here in the UK. But I am absolutely fascinated by kingfishers for the fact is the colour of the, the feathers, they are iridescent that means there's no pigmentation in um 
in the in the color in in the, in the there's no pigmentation either color it's actually changes with light so a kingfisher here and this is our common kingfisher we only have one in the uk it changes light and light so it can go from green to actually blue just by that next picture please thank you okay a lot of people know me for taking big big images that fill the page um if some of you may know me or may not know me there we go that's gone got it off just had a phone call um this is what um look at dawn i traveled if anybody knows me i'm a twitcher so we went to see the royal turn i think I, there was two subspecies an african and american i think this was the american bird if i remember right we were all waiting for the royal turn to come in and i just looked across the bay there and i could see people waking up going to work and i just love the colors so people said i was getting a little bit arty in my old ways uh, but i really like that picture so it's all about the composition as well for me next one please jeff so again we talked about big images that's it. That's what we call a bearded tip. And we can see there that um, that's a male. And obviously another another word from old English word is called bearded reedling, because obviously where they sat. But obviously love these things. And I just again pulling back on the zoom or where the distance I was to take a picture in its natural habitat. Next one, please, Jeff. okay so so what we've got is somebody's ringing the house phone and it's been answered there we go two three four obviously this is live ladies and gentlemen boys and girls so apologies for that hey paul uh we've got a request from facebook i guess they want to see your pretty face and if you could swing the camera out of the way <laughs> it wasn't me i was fine with the camera in front <laughs> i know okay okay <laughs> okay, I just thought the main screen would be showing with the pictures. So, yeah. so this is what we call a yellow wagtail. It's a migratory bird from us, from Africa back to the UK. And we what's have called a dung heap, where the farmer creates a heap of manure to the fields is going to spread on. And this historically has made these birds come in because the puddles form with the rain that we get. And in turn, that brings the literally thousands of flies and insects. And we also get wheat here um, going through. But this was a this was an early morning, so it's not mist. It's actually um, defocused bales of hay. So I'll kind of demystify this picture a little bit. But I just saw, and sometimes little a little is more. And just to see the this bird just sat there waiting to warm up. It was it was half heartedly feeding, but wasn't. Um, and so you can see the little flies or midges around it. And I was obviously I've got I've just got the bale of hay, and I've done this from the car because I, I use the car a lot as a hide. Next picture, please. So I'm hoping I'm trying to show you that within this uh, hobby, you can get some really decent results. Okay, so this is what we call the European cuckoo. We only have one, and this is it. And I do believe this picture was phone scoped. And this is a video grab from the 4K video from my iPhone 7 Plus. Just to show you that. Next picture, please. Now then, we tend to have sometimes exotic birds in the UK because we are an island. And again, I revert back to our twitching uh, days. This bird is called Elvis, the King Ida Duck, Drake. And he's probably back at a little place called the Eiden Estuary, Y-T-H-A-N, above Aberdeen in Scotland. And I've probably seen this bird now four or five times. And I still marvel at that beak and those colours and those wings, as I call off the back, little fins. Elvis tries his best to communicate with the female common eiders, but he never seems to get a mate. And he does stand out. But when you're looking for him, you would think with all that plumage, he would, but he's not. 
and we know it's Elvis because of the scar, that prominent scar. Uh, I believe he's back again this year, but with the COVID, uh, COVID, sorry, COVID-19, we in Britain can't, at the moment, we've got various restrictions because we're split into England, Scotland and Wales. And so Wales and Scotland at the moment are actually shut down for us. So we can only just travel in England lightly in the last two or three days. So I probably won't see this guy this year, but very spectacular. Just a quick story on this. I, the last time I went to see him was maybe two years ago, three years ago. And I turned up there and I could see some people just hanging around and, and the tide was out on the estuary and the eider ducks were in front of me and they were hunting. And I could see a crash, a small crash, because eider ducks actually put their little ducklings together to form big creches to protect them. And then the female eiders, they could kind of try and look after them. And I could see the, the small crash of about eight or nine and two females. And this male was like protecting them from the other males. And I thought, hmm. So again, using my field craft skills, I didn't do anything. And so these guys wanted to walk up and I went, guys, can you just come in here and listen to an old guy? If you wait, that bird will come down to us and it will be in front of us. And some of them we said, if you go up there now, you're going to scare it. If you just sit down here, get your distance, that bird will be down, I promise you. 15, 20 minutes later, they are getting eye-popping views of this bird. He's displaying and everything. And then he literally, we let him go down about another 30 yards. We all got up and walk down past them away down the down the sandy beach on the estuary and sat down again we did that for an hour this was the last couple of shots i got of him actually washing himself to try and um show the ladies again a fast speed produced by i think two and a half thousand iso sorry two and a half thousand of a second using maybe about a uh, 1600 iso on a camera so the Mac Four Thirds cameras are getting certainly getting better with regarding noise. I've used no noise re re reductions whatsoever. I don't use it anyway. It's pictured, yeah. Sorry, long-winded, but great story. Okay, we're back to that follow. So this is a video grab from 4K. The sharpness is there, um, and again, you can see a depth of field is there because obviously where where I've gone to one of these hides, which we can, we have in the UK, we can see some of these birds. But that again is, in the, is, is a sparrow hawk again. Next one, please. Okay, just to show you in daylight and nighttime, I've got a friend who's got a, a set of hides up there in Scotland. So the one I've left is taken in, not dusk, but it certainly isn't bright light, using um, a reasonable ISO. And then I think I, think I whacked the, the right one up to 2000. Just shows you what the darkness can do with the light, but it just shows you the difference. And, and using uh, using a reasonably high high cell speed okay next one okay this is quite an old picture and it goes back 10 years so this would have been a compact camera probably i think it was maybe the contact u4 or the sony rx100 anyway this is eurasian bitten and we'd waited for a few hours in this freezing hide on a nature reserve with the windows open and everybody started to go because it started to snow. You can see the bits of snow in the background of this picture. And then all of a sudden, I just glanced and I saw a movement. And the bird was literally maybe 20 yards away from the hide. And so I could see the snow coming down. So I just literally whacked my zoom up to 60 times. And I think, I think this shot came out at a 13th of a second. And those globules of water or actually snowdrops melting. Within a couple of seconds, it shook its head and they're gone. So the snowdrops, it's longer snowdrops, snowflakes, sorry. And I really do enjoy that pitch because it produced a great moment. Next one, please, Jeff. This again is another 4K. This is a dotterel. Dotterel are very confined and they make their way up to the, the Scottish Highlands. So they come through England and we've got a fair few uh, around at the moment. And more so, I've actually had this happen to me and a friend. I was photographing one and a bird of prey came over and the bird ran towards me, went under the tripod. And then when the, the peregrine went out of sight, the bird just walked back in again. Unbelievable. Because some of these birds never get close proximity to man up on the Scottish moors. So again, they migrate from Africa back up and it's the female who is the more brightest of them. This is a young bird. Next one, please. Right, if I said to you, this is Digiscope, if I said to you, this is manual focus, yeah, it's slightly cropped. 
I've been quite lucky to have good friends on the various islands around England and Scotland. This is called the Farn Islands, where I went to, where visitors are allowed on for a couple of, couple of hours each day. And it has a very big population of seabirds, shags, guillemots, razorbills, puffins, arctic terns, common terns. And I just plunked myself down. And if I said to you, I spent two and a half, three hours getting this picture, and God knows how many hundreds of pictures I took, and I kept maybe seven, and this was the best one. So I've not done a predetermined focus. I actually tracked it and focused it. So that's the bird flying in on a compact camera, Sony RX100, I think, from memory. Um, very, very pleased. Again, in one of my top 10 shots. So you just your eye-to-hand coordination needs to be good. Next one, please. Here we go. Is that the end? I think that's the end, Jeff. So put that to me, please, Jeff. Full screen, thank you. And what we'll do now is um, we'll talk about some of the stuff that uh, I've got lined up for us. So we talked about <clears throat> back into this. Here we go. So the idea is if somebody's been wondering, oh, you've been talking a lot about it, but what is the basic thing that you do? So once we've attached it all on, we switch it on. Um, I pro tend to work with aperture priority. There's my button. And there, slightly, is my focus wheel. So the idea is, is that you focus it from closeness to affinity of where your subject is. And then you literally take the picture. For me, I use this um, cable release, manual cable release. So anything where it's really low because we don't have the Florida sun, Jeff, or the Barcelona sun uh, most times, especially in winter times here. And we have to, us Brits, we have to fight for our lights. So I tend to use this a lot of the time. Um, for me, short bursts and refocus often will probably be my choice of what to do. I've also got a mic in there because I've started doing videos. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. So that's the general side of the photography side. So maybe eight or nine years ago, these things came around, phones. So I'll br I know we've covered it, but I just want to try and quickly go through this. So um, the mobile phone situation now is getting better and better due to the camera sensors on the phone. So for me, attaching a, um, a phone to a scope, or would you believe you can attach it to your binoculars? Okay, so the one thing I've been seeing on the net is what people don't realize is it's at best, it's a, it's a shot. So what I suggest people do, rather than hold their hands out like this and touch it like this, my suggestion is tuck your arms in, take the binoculars and fold them in together, okay? And then by using the screen, take it on the back. I mean, depending on whether you, what type of phone, it's a voice command, or you can buy a Bluetooth dongle, or even with most of the phones now, you can pl plug in a pair of headphones, especially the iPhone range, where you can use the actual shutter press as, as uh, sorry, the volume as taking pictures. So for me, that is this. Another thing that I do use with the phone scoping is there's various adapters on the market. So with, with Kawa, what we've got is, we've got obviously our Kawa adapter for limited models only uh, and, a, and, a bait and a ring and that will fit on there. So various, various rings for all the range with the Kawa. Not too many adapters because obviously we are a, binoc a binocular and, and scope company. We have made some for more of the popular models, the Samsung and uh, thing. So basically what we find is attaching this, again, watch it when you actually put it on. Because if you don't literally put it flush, you'll get dark areas. So try and make sure that the actual thing is flush. We actually can use that, and we can actually use one of these as well, which I use for the, the Kawa DA10, we can use that as well. There are other models available, and the one thing I would say is, 
is the one that most people seem to be put onto because these people actually make them for most models is the foam sculpt model. So this is the foam sculpt model for my 7 Plus. So what you tend to have is you can have the grooves in it, which allows us to allows us to actually work. I don't know if you can see that, but that this is for the cameras with two lenses. So majority of people are kind of finding what's going on, what's happening with this. So the way that the phone's got people use this is that you can actually put it into one groove for the wide angle and then, then move it across a couple of millimeters into the other one. My preference, to be honest with you, if you've got a iPhone or a camera, try and strive to use the two times. A lot of the major uh, adapters now um, will give you this offering, but with the, with the scope manufacturers, especially the, the, the major ones like Cara and others, they've got a wide angled eyepiece. A lot of them have updated their eyepieces. We have certainly at, uh, at Cowan now, so that's our, our wide angle eyepiece, 25 to 60. Uh, what this does is, quickly to get into the point, if you have it on a, two, on a wide angle, let's just take this back to the beginning of mobile phones. All mobile phones were wide angles. So when you put it onto there, you've got that vignetting. So we have to go up the zoom to clear it, and maybe a little bit of fingers of stretching the screen, but not too much, because it, it creates a problem. If you've got the two times uh, lens, I found that when you put it on the combination of the Kawa, the 883 or 884, there's no vignetting. So that means your image is a lot sharper. To me, it's the biggest breakthrough in phone scoping in years, but still people are not getting it. So at 25 mag, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting 50 times mag but the picture is sharper, smaller, <clears throat> and probably get more action with it, as opposed to cranking it up. If that's the only phone you've got with one lens, then use it by all means. But you've got to try and crank up the zoom to make a bigger image, where you can try and do it the other way around and get the image more sharper. That's for me, there's various apps to um, go on there. I think Jeff's, Jeff and other people have covered this. Um, the other thing that I use, both sometimes with my my, with my Panasonic and also my, um, my my mobile phone is I use this it's called a Hudman loop and basically it's a piece of rubber that folds down so it's portable it can be on your neck obviously with the sun on your back so focusing can be an issue for a lot of people where they think it's okay so a lot of bad habits the main bad habit I find with people is they find the bird focus it and leave it alone they can take maybe 20 or 30 shots, they get them home and they're okay, but they're slightly blurred or they're just not sharp. All I tend to do is by using this diopter, it's got a piece of glass in it and it's also got a diopter to plus three, minus three. You can twist that to your eye. So you press that on, tune that into your eye and then you can place that on the screen once you've got it focused and locked and just go back and forth from there. This is the difference between people with sharp pictures and people with not sharp pictures. Um, the other thing to remember also is we have a lot is the 1.6x4092. And for a bit of a giggle, a couple of, couple of years ago, birthday, we put two of these together. And I think it's about 14% light loss, but with the photography and the cameras and stuff, and especially with the mobile phones, not really that noticeable, but very, very high mag. So you're talking two, three, four thousand mag, millimeter mag. And again, but it does get shaky. Um, the other thing that I do take along is, wouldn't be without it, is a battery pack for my phone. Really, really would recommend one of those. And also, there are various adapters. So again, trying to be fair to everybody, Novagrade, they do a double gripper for a universal adapter. Phone scope, do one. Um, the Viking one, I quite like the Viking one, it's quite a sturdy one. So this is for people who maybe just want to attempt this without spending too much money, a universal adapter. So phone scope universal, Novagrade, N-O-V-A-G-R-A-D-E, and the Viking one. Again, your phone goes in there, you can just close it up and attach it and tighten it up. So there are various things. Spare things going back to the DSLR. 
make sure you have a couple of these spare. Always useful, always useful. And I really don't leave anywhere, I don't go anywhere without some kind of um, memory cards in a, in a waterproof case. Especially if you've been on holiday and you, you, know, you literally have spent all that money going and your cards get wet. So again, a little bit of protection. Has anybody got any questions, Jeff? Because you've, you've not nodded me for that yet. Okay. Yeah, Paul, um, can you review some of the apps to, um, to utilize the 2X phones? I don't think anyone has really gotten into that. Well, I didn't do it, cover it last night. So if, if you wouldn't mind, that would be really good on the okay. apps. Okay, apps. The obvious one is the phone scope because it's free. Everybody appreciates that one. Um, second, so phone scope app with a K, P H O N E S K O P E. Uh, another one is Pro Camera, which is maybe a three or four, four or five dollars, three or four pounds. But that is probably more for people who have a technical nature. Some people can't get on with Pro Camera. I find it very intuitive. Um, to the fact is, I actually made a short short film um maybe maybe you can uh, put a link in it somewhere in one of the things uh, rob a link to my youtube phone of the, the the eurasian bit and somebody kind of challenged me a couple of years ago about this and with some of the phones is you might not find it with all it's a kind of trial and error but sometimes a seven plus phone i couldn't get i should choose the lenses it would go black internet to where I could actually choose the, the, the camera so you, if people have got the iPhones and two and two or three screens I did find this uh, and I found pro camera was one that was good for me and it gives you all the format files you want JPEG TIFF raw height it gives you all the kind of um, format of the the layout so three two four three sixteen nine if you want to shoot with that so me, from a point of view, I use a 16.9 a lot because that's the size of when you put your phone on the side or your, your laptop or even your TV these days. So I tend to use that, especially when some of my work is, is put on there, either pictures or that. So phone scope app and um, the pro camera. So again, look at it, review it. Don't spend your money until you've had a look, spoken to other people that use it. Um, the other thing to think about is if you're thinking about purchasing a new phone or changing your contract, I really, really, really would go for the highest uh, memory you can, especially with the iPhones. Memory cards for the Androids, not a problem. My suggestion with the Androids is to actually have a separate card for family and a separate card for birding. That way you don't mess them up and you can just come home and download them. Slightly different with the iPhone because it's a fixed memory. So I have a 128 gigabyte phone that I'm speaking to on, you know, my 7 Plus. I started off with a 4S, a 6. I mean, the difference in the sizes now, that's a 4S. It's a tiny phone, absolutely tiny phone. So again, I think I've probably covered uh, most of my tips in that. One thing I, I will tell you is um, you can check on our social media page on Coa Sporting Optics on Facebook. Um, you can also reach out to us at customer service at COA, K -O -W -A com with any follow-up questions. And we will, um, you know, get these over to Paul as well, make sure he's aware, but he's usually uh, pretty active. And then of course, look up Paul himself, uh, Paul Hackett. Um, and you can certainly send him direct questions um on his facebook page follow him and, and look at some of his work which is phenomenal um I, one thing we didn't talk about jeff yeah go ahead basics really bad thing the tripod and the oh, video yeah. we didn't talk about that so again your choice of stand because at the end of the day if i can pull back a little bit with this originally the tripod you buy for bird spotting they're only meant to cope with the size of the the scope and the weight sometimes angled scope as well so what i found was they they originally they weren't good enough for it and now where you're putting all this weight on the back you're finding this out so the main thing for me is a slide rail a decent slide rail and that's how long my slide rail is to get the balance right 
so when I take the tension off, it it doesn't it doesn't drop down. It just stays where it goes, and I can actually control it where I want with the tension. That's one major thing. I'm sorry I didn't mention that before. Um, I'm so sorry, Jeff. We couldn't meet up this year for biggest week. I was so looking forward to it because I was gonna hopefully have a shot at the Warblers because uh, my good friend Kevin Bolton, who I think maybe he's one of the top digiscopers I've ever met his uh, intensity to get everything right um, being over there I mean it's hard enough trying to use um, a DSLR with autofocus or even a bridge camera but to photograph warblers those beautiful amazing looking warblers but um, I'll be posting a few of those on my Instagram and Twitter feed um, pretty soon because it's all coming round again now with the Facebook and everything they remind you of the the history of stuff. Um, just to let you know, I'm starting up my own website, uh, digiscoper.co.uk. It, it'll probably go live in about a couple of weeks, and I will be offering one-to-one -one workshops uh, and maybe Zoom webinars as well. Um, I kind of um, where we're all in the same boat at the moment. Um, I've done a couple already for a few other people, so I'm quite enjoying them. Um, I charge reasonable money because I have a skill set. People said for over 20 years, you've given away so much. So in these increasing times, I've decided to charge a little bit and hopefully I can get you people interested um, because obviously we still don't know how this thing's gonna, gonna pan out. So I've taken to walks around my house. I know where all the nesting birds are in my, in my garden. I've listed all the areas where the migrating warblers from Africa we've got here in the UK. Um, I've still not heard a cuckoo yet. I've still not seen a swift. Um, but uh, I've also got the wee birdie in the background here. You can hear him calling. So if that's, if that's it, Jeff, I think we've had, a, we've had quite a good session there. I think it's not gone too bad with all the bits and pieces. So is no. there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, just I want to, of course, remind everyone once again, uh, the whole reason we're doing this, uh, we're trying to make up for the lack of the uh, Optics Alley uh, this year and r remind everyone to go and check out timeandoptics.com. Uh, we've got special pricing on, on the co-op products and others throughout the week. Um, do stay tuned to the other um, upcoming uh, speakers. We've got Clay Taylor showing up at two again. Um, um, and uh, I think Rich Moncrief this, this evening at 6 p.m. Um, so a lot of things happening. And again, you're supporting conservation with every purchase you make through Time and Optics. We'll be going to support the Black Swamp Bird Observatory, who, as you know, are the people that run and organize the biggest week in American birding every single year. So that's my last bit. And I think with that, I will bid everyone adieu and we'll check out. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for your time, Paul. It's good seeing you again. Sorry we didn't get yeah, our chance to you, do good the birding on the boardwalk next year. Take care. Thank you. All the best. You. Bye.